It's going to take a little. Turn down your volume a little bit. It's just, it doesn't repeat on, on us. Mine or Sam's? Uh, Sam, just on, on, your, uh, on your car. All right, that's good. Yeah, sometimes with my Bluetooth on, on my, on my uh, car here, you get a little reverb. It's working well now. I think it's okay now. Okay, hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. This is the Be Better Golf channel. Uh, if you want to be able to see these live broadcasts as they happen, make sure that you click the subscribe button and also very important that you click the bell. I never put out any like advanced notice that anything these things are going to happen. I just contacted uh, Tony Lutzak from the Be Better Golf Schools and also my instructor and Sam from Sam Robinson, right? Yep. Yep. Sam Robinson from the My Golf Spy testing facility uh, to come on just a few minutes ago. I had the idea to do it and uh, I I put it on to to do it. So you never you know you will never know when these will happen. So you really got to click the bell. Uh, maybe someday I'll be more professional about it. Also on on uh, the tel the telephone later to talk a little bit from a strokes gain point of view. We're gonna um, call up uh, Richie Hunt oh, from nice, uh, Pro nice. Golf Analysis. So uh, just a second. Okay, cool. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Okay, we are going to talk a little bit at first with Sam. Sam, uh, tell us. You guys just did. You guys have done a lot of really industry shaking studies and everything uh tell us how was the uh the impact of this most recent test and what was the test so firstly the first the, the test that we just completed was probably what i think oh sam, sam talk a little closer to the microphone just so we can hear you sorry so what what we just completed was the is that sound okay it's still uh, still a little low um but, about, if, but I now? think if people, they can figure it out. So, so what we just completed was the largest independent comprehensive golf ball test in the industry. Uh, we tested 34 urethane tour model golf balls, and then we also tested two iotomer golf balls. Um, so 36 balls in total over a three-day period. We hit three different golf clubs on a robot. We hit a driver, a seven iron, and a wedge. Um, the driver and the seven iron were hit at two different speeds, and then the wedge was tested at a single speed. Uh, one test done with wet balls and one test done with dry balls. Um, because a little bit of prior research, we, we've determined that there's some spin and launch characteristic uh, differences that you'll find uh, when, when your balls are wet. Right. But it's, it was a really interesting study. I mean, I was out, at the, I was out during the testing. It was myself and our editor, Tony. Um, and then we brought Matt, our, our in-house video editor, to um, kind of just document the whole thing. And you know, it was it was a little bit boring. Um, it's a little bit more boring than player testing from what we do uh, in our facility. You know, just putting a ball on a tee and watching a robot hit it was <laughs> was kind of boring. But at some points too, you know, you're watching these golf balls go in pretty much the same direction at the same speed, and then all of a sudden you'd see one where it would just kind of like tail off way left or slice way right. It was kind of interesting to see that. You know, I think the biggest the biggest pull away for us was that there's not all golf balls are the same. So, you know, between the top manufacturers, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good consistency, um, even from ball to ball, but you know, even, you know, if you're, you're talking a Bridgestone tour B X golf ball, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, one of their, their balls designed for like a higher swing speed from the, uh, the tour B XS, which is another high speed ball, but it's, it's significantly spinnier. Um, so you, you see, my new differences and also some pretty drastic differences from ball to ball. Right. I got a uh, ad popping up here. Okay, cool. So uh, with that test, uh, what were what was uh, if you had to think of like maybe one or two of the most surprising things? What were they, Sam? I think. Um, I mean, overall, you know, like I said, not all balls are the same, but um, you know, if we're talking like a single golf ball. That was surprising. Um, you know, you've probably heard it already. The the Chrome Soft and the Chrome Soft X didn't really perform up to what we thought it would. Um, there's been some insider talk around the industry on the tour that some of the Callaway guys are are looking into different balls just because they they're not fans of the Chrome Soft or Chrome Soft X. Um, 
and that was that was probably confirmed with our test. I mean, we the ball speeds were significantly lower. I think maybe the major takeaway I found was soft balls or slow balls. Um, it wasn't surprising. We kind of had an idea that this was the case, but you know, we 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 basically saw a direct correlation between compression and ball speed. So the higher the compression value, the more ball speed you got. The highest tested compression in our test was the Snell MTBX, which is a new offering from Dean Snell. Um, and it was, you know, conversely the fastest. Um, so it, it was pretty cool. I mean, you know, for us, this was the first time that we ever did a, a large scale ball test. I've been testing golf clubs at my golf spy in the testing facility for three years, and they've been doing their own club testing for 10. And, you know, this was the first time we, we were able to look at large scale ball data. Um, so we were able to pick out some good, you know, some really good performing golf balls, and that's detailed in our article. I think the top four were the Snell MT, well, the Bridgestone Tour B RX, the Strixon Z Star, and then the two Pro V1, Pro V1, and Pro V1 X um, the, from Titleist. And those are the we would classify those as excellent balls. And one of the things that was interesting is that you know we're, we're not we're usually able to classify a winner uh, when it comes to uh, driver test per se, but for balls, uh, we, we weren't really able to find one clear outlier. Um, you know, there's, there's outliers for performance, obviously. And then, you know, on the poles, they were really good and really bad. And then there was a, a bunch jumbled up in the middle. Um, but again, back to my original point, the, the, the major standout was really the, the Callaway Chrome soft, but then on the, on the other side, and I hate to keep rambling, but, um, you know, the max fly tour CG balls that just came out, those are really good golf balls. I mean, they're, I think they're 35 a dozen. Um, so those performed really well. The new Mizuno balls did really well, um, which is a new offering. We, I don't think we have had Mizuno balls in America, um, at least for the time that I've been playing golf. Um, and then, um, you know, it's your usual suspects up at the top. Strixon did well. Bridgestone did well. Uh, Titleist obviously did well. But, you know, they're, they're, we, got, we basically got six main takeaways, and one of them is – definitely need to be fit for a ball i mean it's just like a driver just like irons the same golf ball isn't going to be the best for everybody Um, yes sam i wanted to ask you you're sam's uh, driving right now from a golf tournament he was playing in that uh my my nephew jack was also playing in and i wanted to ask one of the things that that I, i thought was interesting about your test that um you know jack like most high school golfers because I, I asked him uh, last time we were out on a trip, you know, what golf ball do you play? And he's like, whatever he either finds on the range, you know, where he works or whatever. You know, so he goes from title in one round. He might hit Titleist, Bridgestone, um, you know, like an old Nike they used to make. Like, like he'll hit anything as long as it's like a premium ball, you know. But in this test, is that a good idea for somebody who's like really counting on a hit, making a good score? Uh, I, I would – I would say no. Yeah, I don't think it's a good idea at all. You know, one of the main takeaways we found was and Sam, it, Sam, let me ask you, answer that, excuse me, Sam, answer that question again. Let's try to see your face again and just speak up. I think it'll be okay now. So there you go. So if you're gonna if you're gonna play multiple different types of balls during a round, it's not a good idea. Uh, and and the main reason is because let's say you've got 240 yards of water to carry, right? And you typically carry it 250, 260. And you've been playing a Titleist Pro V1 the whole time, and you know that ball is going to fly 250, and then you lose your Pro V1 on the previous hole, and you pick up, I don't know, uh, a Strixon Q-Star Tour that doesn't have the kind of distance that the Titleist Pro V1 does. And all of a sudden you hit in the water, and you think it's you and not the ball. So... The, the di- there's, there are tangible distance differences between golf balls, you know, even if it's a premium model. And a perfect example, and, I, and I'm not trying to bash Callaway, it just is what it is. If you're playing a Titleist Pro V1 and you pull out a Chrome Soft in the next hole, you can lose four to five miles per hour of ball speed. Ooh. I mean, Tony, you, you probably know in your own experience, that's, that's a significant amount of distance if we're dropping five miles per hour of ball speed. And oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I you're losing a club. From, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Brendan, I know you just got back from doing some speed training and you gained, what, 10 miles an hour of ball speed? Yeah, well, in that trip. Right. You know, from Yeah, yeah, actually from 160 to 172. And if I hadn't broke breaking 170, I probably would still be in Kansas right now because I was disturbing. <laughs> 
So uh, if, if that range had a uh, title list pro V ones, like actual, which was very important to, you know, when we did this, that we were using real golf balls. But if that range, like you said, if that range had had um, just to pick out another slow ball on your list, uh, uh, an AVX maybe, yeah. you, know, yeah. between, you know, instead of pro V ones, if they had an AVX, which is the ball that I play a lot. Um, I think instead of 172, I could have been like, stuck in neutral at, at 169.5 and I would have been uh I probably would have injured myself before I would have actually broken 170. But Tony from from a from a performance coach uh, uh point of view, what what did you find interesting about the data that they collected? Um well first of all to, to hear about Snell was kind of unique because I've been obviously stuck in the research lab. So Sam that's normal man you gotta get used to that boring stuff. That's called research. Um <laughs> You know, the, the thing that, that makes sense to me when we look at the softballs versus, we'll say, the hardballs, you know, take a basketball, deflate it a little bit, try to bounce it. It's not going to bounce as high. I mean, it, it's simple physics behind that. Um, yeah. And then, obviously, fill it the air up, put it down, and the ball re rebounds. So, you know, to me, that it never made sense why they were doing that. But, you know... Unfortunately, as, as Sam knows, and we all know, uh, marketing drives a lot of what happens in golf, not necessarily true science and true physics. Yeah. Well, I thought a so big I thing that, excuse me, Sam, but I think the big thing that my golf pie has shown is that people's personal uh, looks, brand perceptions, and feels can kind of uh, lead them into poor performance. For example, like with the putters, like some people will not putt with a putter that just looks ugly to them, but they could gain strokes from that. And uh, the same could be said about the feeling of a, like I really like the feeling off the face of a soft golf ball, but that might, you know, like I've always liked Chrome Soft, AVX. Um, Wilson had a ridiculously soft ball, like I think it was called the 50-50 or something years, uh, like three years ago. That was like, I loved it. But um, it, but it was uh, just the feel alone can't lie to you, huh, Sam? Well, when you get in, Sam, I'll yeah, jump in there. When you get into perception, when you get into perception, now you're talking about you're basing all your judgment off some previous experience that you had that you judge as your standard. Yeah. You know, so I'll, I'll date myself, you know, with the old persimmon drivers. I mean, they sounded and they felt a certain way. Well, now it sounds in and performs differently you know some people don't like the sound of the tinny drivers and so the manufacturers will play with sound because sound affects feel so really if the golfer wants to do themselves with justice then they're, they're not going to base it off their past perceptions and just base it off what the performance of the golf ball and what happens on the golf course that's what they should do at least absolutely and that that's the unfortunate thing too is you know in I think a lot of times, like you said, Brendan, is that golfers will come into it from a subjective standpoint rather than a performance standpoint where, you know, if before this test, if we pulled 100 golfers and we said, what do you look for most in a golf ball? I, I, I would almost guarantee that a lot of them would say feel. And that's, that's kind of what happened was all these golf companies were doing focus groups and they found that all these golfers wanted feel. So they're like, okay, yeah, we'll give you feel. We'll give you soft feel. And they don't understand that that's actually the wrong way to go. And so we were on a live video on Wednesday talking with Tony, our editor, and um, he said that Titleist probably didn't even want to make the ABX golf ball, but with this golf ball war with, with Callaway, they've got to come out with something that consumers want to buy. And yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that this, this test is going to influence not only consumers, but also manufacturers to change the way that they, they market to consumers, because at the end of the day, we want, we want to put the best performing golf equipment in, in golfers' hands. And it's tough when there's there's golf equipment manufacturers out there that are selling you incorrect products and because it sells. And, you know, that's not to say that the AVX isn't a good golf ball for somebody out there. I'm sure there's a there's a decent number of people out there that the, that the AVX would be a good golf ball. Um, but we've been I think we've been a little bit mismarketed to where a lot of a lot of golfers don't think that they're. Not, they, they don't think they're good enough, and they don't think they can press the golf ball enough. They have there's a there's a there's a lot of misconception and myths with golf balls, and that was that was our main goal was like let's see if we can dispel some of these myths. Let's see if there's something out there in, in this big golf ball test that's going to make all of the marketing jib jab that you've been listening to kind of 
change your perspective on it. So, and, and luckily the, we found the big difference between a lot of the golf balls. Yeah, I think that's the, one of the things that uh, Adam was saying that was so surprising is you would think because of all the, if you were just to look at it, golf balls are all that have to be the same weight, the same size and, and same certain, in certain parameters and drivers, you know, can look radically different. But uh, what what is a bigger performance difference, just in percentage wise, of golf balls or golf drivers? Oh, it's absolutely balls. I mean, we've, you know, and this is something that we run into with most wanted testing in the facility is that if you put, and, that, and that's part of the reason we don't test on a robot with golf clubs is because if you put a, every golf club on a robot, they'd all perform so close together, it'd be hard to determine a winner. Whereas golf balls, I mean, even though we put them on a robot, there there's a larger there's larger differences in the performance of golf balls than there is in any clubs that we test. You know, it's, it's crazy how I've, I've just never seen anything like it. And, you know, you look at averages on any of our driver tests and you can, I look at swing speed data all the time and we're, I'm actually doing the swing speed breakdown. We're, we're going to publish that here pretty soon. And the, the, again, the, the changes are pretty linear between, you know, swing speeds and there's a, there's some shuffling around, but for, for golf balls, I mean, it's unbelievable because I think there's so much, you know, not, not every golf ball is perfectly round either. And core right. centering, there's so many minute details that can affect the way that a golf ball flies um, that can really show you the big differences. Yeah. I wanted to ask you that, Sam, because uh, about, as far as the balls being out of round, Maybe this is something you do in the future, but did you guys uh, test to see balls, like as far as for putting, did you test to see balls that, that rolled more true than other balls or? Yeah, unfortunately we didn't. Um, we were just on a, like on a Iron Byron, it was a Golf Labs robot, um, Golf Laboratories robot, I should say. And uh, we didn't do any putting data. We just did the wedge, the seven iron and the driver. And, and again, this was our first go at it, and I'm sure in the future we'll want to implement that somehow. Good. Um, but for our first go at it, we were just doing the three clubs. Um, we consulted with a few of the major R&D teams um, or some R&D teams from the major manufacturers, and they kind of steer, steered us in the right direction as to speeds and what clubs we should test and how we should test them. What driver did you guys use for the, uh, for the robot? I'm not sure that I'm allowed to disclose that information. Okay. okay. Um, I, I I ever guess. So. Yeah, and uh, I'm because sure, it's a, it's so, a blur in the video, and 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 uh, I, we got that question, but uh, that's yeah. that's fine. Yeah, I don't I don't know. We uh. Here's something here's something you can tell me. Uh, I know that. So we saw the the driver tested at at 85 miles an hour, and then also at 115 miles an hour. You swing your driver right there at about 115. Is that right, Sam? Yep. Yeah. So, uh, just uh, you just finished playing in a golf tournament. What ball did you have in the bag? I actually took the Tour BX out today. I've been playing, nice. I've been loyal to the Strixon Z Star XV for a long time. Um, you know, I've been playing it since almost since I got to my golf box. Probably two years ago, I switched to the ball, and I've I've been in love with the XV for so long, and then. You know, for me at my golf buy, it's it's never a question if I'm gonna put something in that tests well. You know, like if I don't I don't put a set of irons in my bag unless I participated in that test and it's the data shows that I I should be playing equipment. So uh, it's the same goes for the ball. And luckily, I swing. I think my swing speed average is like 116 right now. So it was perfect. You know, I can, I I fooled around with Pro V1 this year. I really like how they went with the lower trajectory. Um, on the Pro V1, and I'm I'm really enjoying that. Um, and then I took the Tor BX out today, and I was I was very impressed. Uh, and it's a little bit softer than the, the the cover feels a little bit softer than the XV. Um, but you know I I was I was killing it with the driver. I mean it was going a long way. Okay, uh, Tony, I'll I'll give uh, let Sam get on to his uh, next appointment, but I'll give you the last question. Oh, so I guess, Sam, uh, tell me about this Snell. This was interesting to see what those guys uh, have come up with. And obviously, Dean's got a, a pretty historical uh, past experience. So is Snell here to, uh, to stay? I absolutely think so. I mean, 
you know, he carved out a really cool market for, for golf balls. He's, he's kind of like that pioneer in the direct to consumer industry. Um, so it's been cool to watch them. Cause when I first got to my golf spy three years ago, actually, I had my initial interview with Adam and he gave me a sleeve of snow golf balls and it was the original MTB. Okay. And I think we may still have a sleeve of them. It says my tour ball on the, on the alignment aid, but it's been cool to see them make some new iterations of golf balls. But, you know, I think, I think with the snow red, he didn't quite get it right. And he's always taking feedback from, from, um, you know, a lot of the testing they do and a lot of their consumers are always asking for feedback and he's always trying to improve, which I really like. Um, whereas, it's a little bit different, right? Because he's a direct to consumer. There's no, he doesn't have tour guys out there playing the ball. So he's not getting, they're not developing the golf ball for tour players. They're developing the golf ball for consumers. So I, I think, you know, with the volume discounts and the, the reduced pricing, the, the golf balls have always been top performers. The guy, I've never met someone more in tune with golf balls than Dean Snell. I, I had the opportunity to play golf with him the first time I ever went down to the PGA show. And I was fooling around with his ball, a Pro V1, and I think a Strixon. And he, he would be sitting in the cart, and I would tee off. And I would walk back, he goes, did you hit a different ball there? I was like, yeah, why? He's like, oh, I could hear it. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he, he was like, yeah, the trajectory was a little different there. I'm like, okay, like, you're way smarter than you should be. Um, but, no, he's they're, they're definitely on the right track with the Snell. Um, if you haven't tried the, the MTB X yet, I will say it's fast. It's really fast, but it's loud. How does it so, feel? Does it feel like a top flight or something hard? Just because that that number is so off the chart. Yeah, the it's ball. not. It's not like rock flight. You know, we're not talking like super hard, but it's it's definitely firm, and the sound is more. You know, I know that we know that sound and feel are correlated, but it sounds louder than it feels. If that makes any sense, mm -hmm. um, I I think it's a really good ball. Um, you know. For me, the only thing that would stop me from buying that ball is because the only thing that stops me from playing it is because I don't have to buy balls. So, <laughs> but, the, but that's that's the reality of it. Like the, the larger manufacturers like Titleist, Bridgestone, Strixon, they have the ability to have their quality control to a level that, you know, Dean doesn't really have. I mean, he may have it, but we saw some inconsistencies with the, the shot area at, at high speeds with his ball. So, and, and, you know, with Titleist and, and Bridgestone, it's a little bit tighter. And, and that's part of the reason we test with Bridgestone in the office, because we know how tight their, their tolerances are on, on golf ball production. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, they're, they're absolutely here to stay. And, and this is, you know, he sold out. They're, ba they're on back order till mid-May. That's um, great. Yeah. It's Sam, uh, when, when you're playing golf tournaments, are you using the check-go machine before to put a line on for putting? I've Epsom salted before. I don't have the check gun machine, um, but I've done Epsom salt where you balance the golf ball and then you put the line on it. Um, I think that's beneficial. I know a lot of tour players do that as well, um, but I would always recommend it. But that's another cool thing about the Max Flight golf balls is they do that at the factory. That's cool. Oh, wow. So that's that's where that CG comes from. It's a CG balanced golf ball. Um, you know, for so where they have the putting line, it's already been figured out that that's the yeah, spot. Yeah, they don't stamp them until they find the right CG. Oh, that's cool. That's a Dick Sporting Goods ball, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, I want to say it's thirty four ninety nine. And okay. the best max fly ball I've ever hit, I'll tell you that. Cool. All right, Sam, we're, we'll we'll let you go, but thank you so much for stopping by on the stream with us, and uh, you know how to contact me if you ever want to talk. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. I said hey to Jack for you, so. Oh, you did good. Yeah, I, I told him that my spies were at the, uh, at the golf course and told me he had a. He's been playing well. He just needs to hit it, you know, if he can hit it a little closer to how far you hit it, he would be uh, right there. Yeah, uh, that, that distance comes with time. How old is he now? 17. Oh, yeah, he'll, he'll be there in a few years. Uh, yeah, he's kind of a late bloomer with that. I think he's that's why he's, he's got to keep with it. I think, like, his um, junior year, of, if he's like the rest of the family, I think his junior year of college actually will probably be his big year. Yeah, good deal. <laughs> All right, oh, if everybody wants to check out the My Golf Spy test, go to my golf go to mygolfspy.com and you can see it. Also, follow their YouTube. I know that they're um, about seven months ago have gotten more seriously into their YouTube channel. They have a lot of really cool videos there. And also, you can follow uh, Sam on Instagram. What's your Instagram, Sam? My Instagram is ram underscore sobinson. So my first two initials switched. And then my, okay. Twitter, is, my Twitter is golf at golfspy underscore sam. 
follow him on those platforms. And uh, Tony and I are going to stay on to do some other talks. And we're going to call um, Richie Hunt, PGA Tour analyst. Uh, uh, what is he like a, a strokes gained swing analysis guy for a lot of PGA Tour players? Sam, you're welcome to stay on, but uh, you you just uh, hang out at your leisure. I'm going to call Richie now. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sam. I'm going to run, guys. Sam, Hello, tell Tony Covey I said hi. I will do that. That was the old Saratoga days. Take care, oh, yeah. man. I'll give him yeah. your best. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Okay, guys, we're gonna. I'm gonna call Richie right now on here and just. Just uh, Richie's, okay. putting, Richie's putting out some really good stuff on Twitter. Really good observations. Hey, Richie, this is Brendan Navore from Be Better Golf. Hi, how you doing, Brendan? Good, man. Uh, I'm on a live stream right now uh, on Be Better Golf, and Tony is here with me. Say hi, Tony. Hey, Richie, how are you doing? Good, how you been? Good, so, almost, uh, almost done with this PhD thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were just talking to uh, Sam from my, my Golf Spy, who they just tested uh, dozens of golf balls and found kind of some uh, stark differences in all the different kinds of golf balls. And it had me wondering, the thing that people are mostly looking at when they see those tests are uh, the, the distance that the different balls go and then also the spin. So um, tell people a little bit about what you do to make uh, PGA Tour and elite golfers better as far as uh, the uh, the uh, reports that you put together for that. Yeah, well, uh, kind of the nuts and bolts to it is we go into the data uh, further than your typical uh, standardized type of data, which would be like greens and regulation, putts per round. But we're actually looking at uh, data that correlates to how many uh, strokes uh, the player is gaining versus the rest of the tour. Uh, I had, uh, a lot of data with, let's say, one of my clients is uh, Charles Howell III. Uh, what I'll do for him is I'll take an event like uh, this week at Quail Hollow, and I'll look at the last five years that he's played Quail Hollow, and I can identify what specific shots on that course that he struggled with. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can say something like the drive on number one, the drive on number eight, 12 and 18, uh, the approach on 13 and 14, and the putting on uh, 10, 16 and 18. So, so you're, uh, you're kind of highlighting different areas or different shots on the golf course that you find would like to let him know like, hey, this is a very important shot here and here. Well, it's more of a, a shot that he has struggled with. Uh, because if he's performing well on a shot, that might be an important shot because of the course's design where there's a big variance in, in results. But if he's performing well on those shots, uh, I don't even bother with it because, you know, he just keep, keep on doing what he needs to do. But uh, with shots that he struggles with, then we'll kind of go over, uh, okay, here's what you struggle with, and, you know, maybe you need to – uh, change your strategy with that or, or just maybe put a little more focus on that during the practice round. Uh, but we also look at things like uh, overall, where is he uh, performing well from and versus where he's struggling from. So he may be uh, struggling on approach shots from, say, 150 to 200 yards, and then we uh, provide benchmarking for him to kind of figure out uh, – if he hits a certain benchmark, you know, this will improve his scoring average by so much, which will result in uh, uh, so many FedEx points and so forth. All right, so this is, uh, now coming back to more um, regular golfers, Richie, based on this test, uh, a, a question that I wrote to you that I'll ask you again is, from a strokes gain perspective, for, you know, let's let's take just like uh, low low single-digit handicappers, would it be better for a golfer to have a ball that goes further? Like in this test, they had balls that went from 10 to 15 yards further. Or a ball that goes shorter, but it would be softer around the greens. What do you, what would you rather, what do you think would get people to actually shoot better scores, Richie? Well, all things being equal, the ball that goes further is going to help them shoot lower scores. Uh, you know, let's say, I think, 
in the Mike Hall spy test, they had a difference as big as, say, uh, about 17, 18 yards, I'd say. What was it? Was yeah, that's right, 17 yards. Yeah, that would be, if you did that on one hole, I mean, it kind of varies depending on the hole design, but you would probably see about a uh, difference in, say, about 0. 0.08 strokes just on that distance alone, but you got to think about that. If you multiply that by say 14 times in a whole, in a round of golf, that's almost about a stroke difference. Yeah, that's big. And then let's just say, I don't know that this is true, but let's say that the ball that goes 17 yards shorter is also, uh, uh, is also much softer around the greens. That's maybe a little bit harder to quantify, but how do you value that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I haven't really looked at much data with that in that regard. I mean, I'm basically looking at just the pure data as far as uh, distance and its impact. See, what you see on tour, and it also really applies for regular golfers as well, is the longer you hit the ball, the more likely you're, uh, you're going to have a shorter average length birdie putt. So... Like a guy like, uh, let's say we we'll use a tour example, a guy like Bubba Watson, uh, he's going to sink more birdie putts than Brian Gay, even though Brian Gay is a far more skilled putter. And the reason why is because despite uh, Bubba Watson not having as great of a skill set with, with the putter as Brian Gay, he's leaving himself with shorter length birdie putts on average so uh you know the make percentage on tour from say 15 feet is 22 percent from 20 feet it's 14 percent uh you know if brian gay has uh is going to compete against bubba watson by math alone he has to putt better so if you're going to use a shorter golf ball well, guess what? Now you're going to have to be more skilled with the putter to sink as many putts as the guy that uh, hits the ball further because he's got a longer golf ball. What golf ball are you using? I know you're you're a good player, Richie. What 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 do you use? Uh, well, I was using the TP5X from TaylorMade, and then I was also kind of experimenting with the Bridgestone XS. The but, tiger, uh, the tiger ball, right? Yeah, I was thinking about, but I. I just bought some of the Bridgestone X because I think they might be a little more fitting to what I need. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, you know, the thing that I liked about the study was it showed, because I'm kind of a, a low launch, high spin player, and I could see in that Bridgestone uh, X ball, uh, not the XS, just the X ball, it was, uh, it's a low spinning ball that also is, is launches kind of high. So, but it was, it was within half a degree. Tony, uh, what do you what do you want to say to to Richie and how how can do you think regular golfers use some of the information he talks about and also this equipment stuff to uh, actually make a difference in their game? Well, I mean Richie's book that he produces is like the best deal in the world for like ten bucks. I mean you get three hundred some pages of how to improve your golf game from a course management standpoint. So Richie's just done a Richie you've done a phenomenal job with that. You know, and what, what I've taken out of that that I give to my students is trying for them to understand kind of like the he uses red and green and, and yellow targets or air zones is just having them understand not to get frustrated on the golf course. There's certain times where these guys will expect to get the ball within three feet and percentage wise, tour players don't even average that. So don't do it. And so I think that's probably the you know, one of the biggest things is them to accept that golf is not perfect. You're not going to hit it perfect every time, but you're only going to, the good ones are going to come at these particular areas or these particular zones. And I think that's just kind of like the simple direct thing that the average golfer can get. Cause we, you know, they, they don't have five years of data from the PGA tour, um, you know, in their, you know, GPS, but that's common though. I think the GPS has some opportunity with that where you can track, over time um like the tour stats but i, I think that it's it's worth it richie actually should sell it for more but it's one of those things that people can actually um you know get with somebody to not get over analytical but see how it applies and the and the color coding zone is perfect 
Go ahead, Richie. I'll... Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, you, you'll find it's a little bit of a double-edged sword a lot of times. You'll find that a lot of the uh, statistical information that I've researched on, a lot of it is common sense, and then some of it isn't, you know, it's surprising. Uh, it kind of goes against what common sense is. But, you know, if one of the reasons why, let's say, the long players on tour – uh, tend to do the best is, you know, you, it's hard to take your putting, good putting with you from week to week. The best putters on tour really only putt great in about a third of their tournaments. And then probably about, so let's say your average tour player plays 24 events or so, 25 events. Uh, they'll play, they'll putt great in about eight of those events. And they'll probably putt poorly in about two of those events. And then the other events, let's say uh, the other 14 events, they'll putt somewhere kind of average to above average. Uh, but you, so obviously you just can't take great putting with you everywhere you go. But if you have that distance off the tee, uh, you can always minimize the effect of when you're not putting as great. And, you know, that's the other thing, too, about distance – off the tee is you could take that with you anywhere. Uh, if you're long, you can take that to Houston or Harbor Town or, or Sawgrass. If you're, uh, but you know, you could be typically very accurate off the tee, but you know, sometimes you're not going to take that with you every week. Uh, same thing with putting or iron play, but power, if you have it, uh, you can take that with you every week. If you don't have it, you can't take that with you. So. Richie, a, a final question before uh, we let you go. But if you were to, and I know you've done this before, but if you were to consult with, like I have a, a like half dozen or, or 10 friends that are on the fringes of professional golf. So they're playing things like the Bow Tour, the Golden State Tour. And, uh, you know, they were good college players. And now, now they're hoping in their uh, middle 20s to eventually make a jump to, to one of this kind of sanctioned tour. What would you tell those players? That, you know, obviously, it depends, but beyond it depends. What would you tell those players they should really be focusing on if they want to make that next uh, step? Usually the big fault I see with these guys uh, is usually I'd say they're – Mid to long approach shot play is a problem for them. Uh, so I would say right around, I'd say 160 to 210 yards. Uh, and when they get to the, uh, let's say the PGA Tour level, they, they don't perform as well as those top guys there. And then they it's kind of a, a blind spot for a lot of golfers. Uh, but I'd also work on uh, – putting from five to 15 feet. A lot of guys at that level, they work on a lot longer putts than that. And really once you get outside 15 feet, uh, putting starts to become more about luck than actual skill. And what happens, I call it a volatile metric. So uh, if you're really good one year outside 15 feet, uh, uh, time you're likely to uh, regress towards the mean versus uh, if you're really poor from outside 15 feet, you're more likely to over time progress towards the mean. So we've uh, seen that in the most, in the most kind of vicious example with Jordan Spieth. I don't think anybody exactly. made more putts outside of 15 feet than he did. And now it's it, almost like the golf gods knew it because they are just like giving him a smackdown <laughs> recently. Very true. Hey. Hey Richie, what do you? How does green speed and I guess undulation play into that? How do you kind of correlate that with the players? Because you take like the Masters, obviously has a speed and severity of slope. Uh, then I'm just trying to think, maybe Harbor Towns, uh, obviously a little, maybe a little bit slower. Um, you know, how would how would the average golfer be able to maybe doesn't play those type of speeds? And how does that green speed affect that? What have you seen? Typically, what we see is slower green speeds means lower make percentage. So if you're, uh, let's say, just use a tour example, uh, from eight feet 
uh, tour player, average tour player makes about 50%. Uh, if the greens are slow, it's a, you know, you play around nine or so on the stimp. That may, that's probably going to go down to say 45%. Wow. That's why I'm missing all these putts on these Muni courses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Mark Brody did a thing the other day that, uh, or a couple weeks ago, and it showed that from six feet uh, at the Masters, players make more uh, putts from six feet than they do on other courses. Uh, but the mm -hmm. only other part of it, too, is uh, kind of the physics of it. <clears throat> if you have a really super fast green you can't really make them too undulated because the ball won't uh stay on the green right you see with also with fast greens is the difficulty isn't really with the putting it's more a little bit more with approach shot but really with the uh like a short game the pitches and and, and the flop shots and the bunker shots on the game that's where fast green really well, thank you so much for coming on with us, Richie. If, uh, just uh, to get back to the original point of the call, I just want to ask you finally, um, what do you what do you think what do you think the effect on the tour will be from a test like this, and then also maybe even on the industry with maybe like some of the words like soft and things like that? Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting. Um... You know, you got to deal with players and their contracts, um, and most of them are really under titleists because they're the big uh, contract with the golf ball. Um, and you know, the Pro V1 and Pro V1X tested out pretty well as far as distance goes. Um, but you know, if now a lot of players are kind of abandoning uh, contracts because the first size is so big, so. I think it probably had more of a bigger effect on the public and Joe Amateur versus uh, the tour. And then maybe eventually if it affects the amateurs, then maybe I'll creep into the tour, which is kind of an odd situation. It doesn't usually happen that way. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I know Phil Mickelson has been just speed obsessed. And uh, yeah. for him to be playing the ERC ball, which was extremely low on the speed, he would be giving up about – um, two and a half or two and a quarter miles per hour on ball speed. So that's the difference between like 180 and 178. Uh, I can't see a guy like Phil saying like, oh, that's okay. I'll give that up to, to get it. Or like, I think Phil and in Haney's book, Tiger, and a lot of these top guys, they, they're almost as obsessed with speed as, um, as the regular golfer on the driving range is, it seems like. Do, do you find that? Like they really fixate on speed? Yeah, I mean, it's... They are, but they aren't in some situations. It's always kind of difficult to get a read from a tour player. And if, believe you me, if I've had a dime for every time I talked to a tour player, worked with them for years, and then they come around and they say, you know, I, I discovered something, and then it's like, yeah, we've been talking about that for the last three years. Right. <laughs> yeah, it only counts if they come up with it, which I'm guilty of as well. Yeah, the first person that tells you something is an idiot, you know, the second person is a genius. So. Right, right. <laughs> okay, Richie, I'll, I'll let you go, but thanks a lot for hanging out with us, and we'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks a lot, Brandon. All right, bye. See you. All right, guys, thanks for watching. We're going to uh, hang out and talk to Tony a little bit about what he has going on. And also, uh, Tony, we're coming up. We have just two spots left at the Be Better Golf School coming up on May 18th and 19th. One or two spots left there. So send me an email, contact bebettergolf at gmail.com. You can find information about it at bebettergolf.net slash school. Tony, uh, talk, talk to me a little bit about your own game, actually, because you were, you were hitting, but you haven't had uh, really any time at all in 2019 to practice. But it's, it's interesting as people, you know, with the Masters and everything are coming out of hibernation, what do you do to get back, to get sharp again and to actually find the low point and find, you know, center face contact? Oh, well, the good thing is, you know, some of those uh, old motor patterns are still there. It's just got to get the rust off, but you have to have good alignment. So the alignment stick is already down here on the range. I snuck out here 15 minutes before the phone call and uh, finished up with exams this week. So, 
it was a matter of just kind of jumping back into it and kind of just getting my rhythm, getting my timing, that the sequence down, but really just feeling the motion, not even overthinking it, because that's one thing I think a lot of people do is, you know, they come up for a lesson and, well, I got this, 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 you know, 10 things I need to address. And it's like, whoa, time out. Swing doesn't last that long. You can't do that. So I think simplicity is is a key factor with people to, to, to focus in on getting back into the swing of things. Yeah, and and Tony, I know that uh, if somebody is walking out to the range for the, for the first time in a while, other than putting alignment sticks down, what what uh, what do you think is a good kind of uh, reemergence drill that people should do? Yeah, I would say there's a there's a couple of them. Feet together is a great way to kind of start out, just to get some arm swing going. Um, and then also really working on your finish. And that's kind of one of those things. Well, I'll actually kind of just hold my finish and just kind of get some feedback. What am I feeling? How, how does my coordination feel? And what's the ball flight doing? Because what, what, I don't want to get into just hitting the ball. I want to go ahead and be making a good swing. So that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm also looking for, which it really isn't a drill. It's just being aware. Um, the other thing is really working on – my takeaway. And that for me, that's probably the biggest thing. And I noticed on my setup, I was too close to the ball that caused my swing to get a little too vertical and I couldn't get through the ball. I kind of got stuck as the club came down. Well, making sure my setup is correct. My distance from the ball. Now all of a sudden I could feel my arms kind of swing on a different trajectory. And now I was able to get through the ball. So, you know, for me, I make sure my distance is good and make sure my hands, uh, my checkpoint is where my hands are relative to my toes and making sure they, they're not too far in. And then on the takeaway, just really knowing where the club is. So, um, you know, when the shaft gets parallel to the ground, where is that club? And I, I use my alignment sticks and match that up. So after that, then I was just kind of getting that feel again. Yeah, I wanted to, okay. So we were watching, a, there's a new show on the Golf Channel I wanted to, uh, to chat about. It's a, uh, Como concept. So Chris Como, very famous golf coach who worked with Tiger Woods for a couple of years uh, in that kind of limbo stage. So it was after Tiger's five win season, which was his last year with Comey, with uh, Sean Foley, I think. That was 2013. And then there was this limbo stage with Chris. And then uh, and then now Tiger is just basically on his own, taking some advice from Noda and also that very young guy. Um, from Tennessee that worked with Kenny Perry, I forget his name. But um, so, so on that show, one of the things they, they talked about on this show on that show was this move that Trevor Emmelman talked about and uh, got a lot of buzz online, where he takes a, the, an axe back here, and instead of what you would you would do, see some golfers do with the golf club, where they go spinning this or or just going this way, the the move was taking the axe off your shoulder and and throwing it into the ground back here. So um, did that seem familiar to you at all, Tony? <laughs> a little bit. Other than throwing the ax, that scared oh. me. <laughs> throwing yeah. things is not a good thing, especially this heavy ax. You know, I mean, that's just, that's bad thing. But obviously, what is he trying to do? He's trying to get his arm swing going, get the arms accelerating faster than his body. And which is, you know, as we've talked about for the last couple of years, um, you know, that's the feet together. That's a flamingo drill. So when we take a look at acceleration, and I'm going to be posting this now that I understand Calc 4 and we can measure things in 3D space. When we take a look at the KVS, let's take a look at the kinematic sequence that you see in KVS. And you see the hips, and then all of a sudden they'll say the torso, and then the, the hands spike way up to the top. Well, we can do uh, what is called a line integral, and we can actually measure that area underneath those lines. Well, that's the work being done. So when we look at it, arms are doing much more work in the golf swing, three times possibly as much. I haven't done the integration yet versus the, the pelvis and the torso. So um, to me, this finally, it's okay to swing your arms and it's not a taboo to use your right side and it's not a taboo to use your arms. Oh, hold on. Maybe the smaller muscles are doing a little bit more work. So all of a sudden there seems to be a, a paradigm shift in instruction right now. I think that's where it's coming from. Well, a little bit it's okay, but the thing I, I thought was interesting about that is you're seeing them do this, and they're, say, and they're also then doing it with uh, rubber bands and cords yeah. in the gym, 
and you're seeing them do this move, and they're they're going right up to the line of saying arm swing, but then they just they know that that will kind of flip people's brains. If you tell them <laughs> do an arm swing from here, they'll think, well, hell, I've been doing that for 20 years, even though even though they haven't. Um, right. One thing I wanted to ask you, Tony, about uh, you know that one study that you referenced a while ago, I think it's 2006 study about muscle activation in the golf swing, where they yes. have sensors on the pecs, on the on the back, throughout the whole body, you know? And right. uh, I wrote down some numbers here. Um, Tony, can you back up just a little bit for us and tell us what the, the forward swing is, and then also what the acceleration phase is, those two, those two uh, parts of the golf swing. Okay, so the forward swing, if my memory is, is correct, was transition. And then acceleration was through impact, I believe, or that's flip flopped. I don't know if you got the the paper in front of you. Yeah, here in front of me, it says the forward swing is from the top of the back swing until swing to, until when the shaft is parallel to the parallel ground. To the ground, and then and acceleration. Then acceleration is from, from parallel to the ground to impact. Right. So one yes. of the things when when uh, we when Tony, you always talk about the the uh the pecs both pecs but but also this kind of i don't know if girdle is the right word but this basically unit here being incredibly active in the in the golf swing right correct correct yep so one of the things i saw which was making me wonder if there's almost like a double pulse in the uh pec on the downswing it says uh in their study they said in the forward part of the swing the the right pec is is lit up or basically is engaged at 64%. So it's not just a an, an all out flexing from the top, but it's, it is doing a, some good work, 64%. And then in the forward part of the swing, then it goes all the way up to 94% Correct. On, on that forward part. So what I was wondering, wanted to ask you before our, uh, our big school coming up at the Windstar was almost like, because uh, uh, Stuart McGill and some other people were saying like how the really elite pitchers and also golf clubs, they can flex a muscle, then have it relax very quick and then flex again. Flex again. Do right. you think some kind of a 64%, then a relaxation, then a, then, because it doesn't seem like it's just like from here, just like flex and smash as hard as you can. It's almost like a, you have to do it a little and then really pour it on. What do you think? Um, I mean, I'm I'm a little bit familiar with McGill's work, uh, phenomenal spine biomechanist, and all those research is just top notch. So, I've seen that. I've been trying to understand the double pulse because it was the only thing I I would be kind of thinking about is I see that preactivation before the forward swing starts because that's some of the motor intent. We're gonna have muscle activation before there's actually movement, you know, and, and that gets into the motor program. So. As I intend to hit it, and I think that's where it more lies in, but I haven't looked at his studies on, on the timing of it because I go and then now I'm really going through impact. So to me, it kind of it matches up. I think the question is how do we take that concept and then how do, can golfers use that? And that's where we transition it. It feels smooth, and then it's power at the bottom versus trying to power at the top and now all of a sudden we try to correct it at the bottom. So that's that 64 to 93% or 90% transition from here down. It's not going to be a quick, hard transition. It's going to be arm swing and a smoother transition, and then it builds up. Yeah, one thing I thought also was interesting because we hear so much about um, people trying to get a ton of extra speed from their lower body just to, to button this up. In the, that forward part of the swing, it said that the uh, the right glute is 100% like stable. You know, it's, it's yep. basically like totally uh, flexed. But then in the forward part of the swing, it goes all the way down to 50%. So it's basically just holding you up a little bit. Uh, Tony, in some of this ground force stuff that, that I've been talking to all the guys who are like big experts in that, they're saying that the peak ground force into the ground is not happening like at the ball, but like kind of up by their up by your neck or so. Uh, how do you think that people can use information like you know? How can we kind of blend these two worlds of 
you know, some of the elite golfers have kind of maximized their arm swing. So they're looking for a little bit of extra percentage from some right. brown stuff. So how can we kind of put these two worlds into like a peaceful harmony to make people better? Well, and I think that's when you when you looked at what Phil did and talking about that with the body track, they were talking about how his body was really more beneficial down at the bottom of the swing versus this big early transition. So the question is, how can we get we got to remember that ground force reaction is or ground reaction force is basically the force we're putting in the ground. We can put that by kind of flexing and sinking into it. So if I'm going to go jump, I actually lose a little bit. And then now as I kind of load and jump, I can create more. So the question is really let's use the arms and the body, especially the, the, the legs and the, the pelvis, the glutes in coordinating. So if you just take the average golfer, I think it's this simple. If I'm going to throw a ball and I'm going to kind of throw it out in front of me a little bit, there's going to be this natural kind of loading into that left leg. That's going to peak up as ground reaction force because it's kind of going from straight. I'm flexing it. And now I'm going to kind of straighten up and get through it. So it's when to use the body and, and it's that transition of just thinking about throwing. So depending on what the golfer's habits are, um, just as simple as throwing a ball. And I remember you've done some stuff with throwing uh, something in a sand, in a, uh, yeah, a sand, hammer into a sand dune, yeah. Yeah, in sand dune. So something like that. I've I've had some of my golfers. They they've jumped into the medicine ball throws and stuff like that. Is because they're trying to basically get that bracing and get into that coordination and then explode up through the ball. That's kind of what I've gathered from Phil. Uh, we just got our Kistler plates. I finally got them working. So we're gonna. That'll be one of the projects. Uh, hopefully, this next couple of weeks before the school can able to dive into a little bit more. Yeah, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, because you're one of the only pe people I talked about, you had this interesting the uh, idea that I get with the lower body as far as um, I wanted to talk to you about. But uh, one of uh, the thing, because I've always had a hard time with the idea of what people mean when they say rotation. There's a lot of coaches that um, you could hear them talk for 15 minutes and you'd be rich if you got a nickel for every time they said rotation. You <laughs> right. You would think that rotation is the end-all be-all of golf. So and I think a lot of that you see people um, hearing stuff like that, and then you see people on the range just up there just spinning, spinning, you know? Right, so correct. So something that I thought was interesting, I was talking to Dr. Scott Lynn, who works for Swing Catalyst, one of the uh, force plate companies. And I said, well, what do you think about the, the difference between – rotation that would be like an internal rotation let's say like i can stand here and i can do this you know and that's like yep. i can even like hang off of some monkey bars and and rotate my hips right um that would be like an internal rotation and then and i was like but then also because we noticed when i was doing some stuff on the plates that i was getting a whole lot more rotation but it was but i wasn't trying to twist at all it was just i was pushing the ground a little differently and that was getting my hips open so correct. Yeah. So if we look at jumping and we look at what, but what we, and how to apply that into the golf swing, it's a little bit more of a kind of a, a coupling effect. So if you think about it, I can actually, I could spin this grip or I can actually pull, push my hand one way, pull my hand back the other way. And I get much faster rotation. So with the two legs, that's how the legs are going to be used in the golf swing is we get this position, I'll say, I don't know if you can, I'll back up a little bit, is we kind of get this almost a scissoring action here, loading into this right glute, working this way, and that kind of gives us some coupling. So we're kind of pushing and pulling, in a sense, on both sides of the body to get us more rotation. Because once we maximize our arm swing, then the only way to improve it is to maximize our body pivot. Yeah, I thought a great story I heard about that was this guy – um, Dr. Lin had worked with this guy, this uh, tour player called Jazz uh, Jaina Watanand, who's on the uh, Asian tour, like one of the top 100 players in the world. He's very good, uh, or maybe top 200. Anyway, so so they had him on on a uh, a system that's similar to a gear system that could see all of his, you know, exactly how his body was moving in 3D space. And they also had him on the force plates. And one of the interesting things they saw was 
he got his hips more open than Rory McIlroy. It was like 750 degrees of that like quickness. Like, so he got his hips super open, but then on the force plate, he was doing almost like he was way almost half of what a tour average was of force into the ground. So Tony, like that force coupling that you're talking about, just from those two things, they could tell that he was t twisting his hips open from the inside, you know, like actively right. opening his hips, but he wasn't getting his hips open by doing that force coupling or pushing. So uh, right. that's one of the things they worked on with him was like, hey, like we might actually get your hips to open less, but get you to push in a way that's, so actually that, that hip opening actually means something. And he went on to qualify for the British Open and win like three times on that tour. And who knows if that was the reason, but, but it did happen that way. So it's, it's yeah. interesting. So when people are hearing uh, teachers talk about how important rotation is and how uh, you should be seeing two cheeks at impact from a down the line view, what do you, what do you think about as far as the connection between rotation and like better impact? Well, I, I don't see it at all. So, I mean, for the average golfer, they think of rotation. I'm, I'm just thinking of spine damage down at L5 and L4 and L3. So, to me, you know, that that's the mistake, is they're thinking about trying to twist and be open. So, I got all this axial rotation around my spine, and I'm just tearing it up. Versus, let's get into more of a load, which actually kind of gets the pelvis, instead of doing this, it kind of loads it. And then it springs this way. So it's, it's more of a cam type of action, which is a rotation, but it's more of a cam versus, we'll say, like kind of like a flywheel, which has more momentum versus just a spinning cylinder. So that's what we would want to see difference. And we would see substantial difference in the force plate if more through a flywheel type of design versus just a cylinder rotating. All right, guys, finally, I just wanted to let you guys know about this exciting school that we have coming up and oh, up. Only one or two spots left. I've um, been so busy with the channel. I just haven't really put out any marketing stuff about it. But uh, very, very, yeah, very luckily, uh, uh, Be Better Golfers were paying attention to the uh, one thing that I did do about it. So <laughs> we uh, have one or two spaces left for the Be Better Golf School at, on May 18th and 19th at the Windstar Golf Academy in Thackerville, Oklahoma, which is less than a mile from the Texas-Oklahoma border. So uh, really excited about that school. Tony, um, I know that, uh, oh, also I wanted to let you guys know, a lot of people have been asking me, I am gonna be bringing, I have a, a lot of these new uh, fun tools that I got at the Tour Tempo spot in Kansas. So uh, working on, some uh, it was a cool experience, Tony, because I was there for uh, two and a half or yeah, about two days and um, doing golf stuff forever. But like uh, John, who does the 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 stuff there, like I I never had a swing thought or anything that he gave me. He was just like, hey, use this tool, and then I'm snapping it this way, and he's like, now use this tool, and I'm snapping it another way. He's like, now hit a ball and see if that works, <laughs> and then so that's kind of the the oh, most. Love that. Right. That's kind of the motor learning stuff that I like because something that you'll relate to, Tony, uh, from having uh, worked on my swing so much, is that uh, I can take th this speed ball, which is the same weight as a driver, and it's got a ball in the end, just like a driver. And I can whack this pad at uh, over 130 miles an hour, you know, you know because I'm athletic. But uh, when the golf ball's there, I'm my best was 118, which is great, but it kind of shows, as you've always said, that thinking makes you slow. So me right. thinking, trying to put it on the ball makes me slow. What do you think is that bridge that can get people beyond thinking and into just like being as athletic as they know they can be? I love that. I can't wait to see those tools because if you're, you're getting that kind of speed, the question is then can we get you to basically train faster on the range and not worry about where the ball goes you know and then eventually as you improve your technique have it dialed in so it's going to be a gradual process uh but it, it's great to see use this tool and this is what happens i mean that's kind of in a sense what we want to do with some of the flamingo drills and stuff like that we do at the school is get the person to identify and coordinate things 
And it's like, okay, that's it. Yeah, that's that's all it is. It's that simple, but it's that efficient. So this way you can just play better golf. So I think that's going to be the key. And I'll be interesting to see what happens, um, you know, over the summer. Because it will take about three to six weeks for that motor pattern to change. So I don't know if we'll be able to get you up to 130, but I would expect I don't want that, say yeah, 120. Yeah. I, I would say 120 would be would be awesome. Well, I'm a, you know I'm a I'm a ball speed person now, so I, I hit 172 in Kansas last weekend, which was a lot of fun and was awesome. But it was like that was literally uh, an hour working out before that, and and then also like an hour doing to it. Like it it was like revving up a very like you know it was doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> at that point. So uh, eventually, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, you can raise the peak, you can raise raise the average as well. So. Um, but that's the thing. I got to stick with it. So uh, that's what I plan on doing. All right, guys. So uh, go check out BeBetterGolf.net slash school. And you can see information about that. You can check out more information on Tony through his YouTube channel. If you type in Tony Lukasak Golf oh. into yep. uh, the search, uh, you'll see it there. But uh, just want to let you know about that. Also, follow us both on Instagram. We're trying to put more stuff up as the uh, golf season's coming through. Mine is BB underscore golf show. And what's yours, Tony? I think it's Tony Luzak golf. I think it's the same thing or Tony Luzak. It's been a while since I posted stuff. So, but we do got, I got some news for you. Come, uh, come to the school. I'm, I'm hoping to bring our new AI training device, a prototype. At really? The school. What does yeah. it do? Uh, you'd have to come to the school to find out. Artificial actually, training device. So, so we're going to have some beta testers there as the be better golfers, huh? Yeah, we should have. We got the prototype. I'm actually doing the testing next week on it. Um, and we are uh, – so that's where I've been, just in the research lab, getting all the, the hardware and the software kind of set up to – and the mocap set up to start matching up trajectories. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of leave it like that. But it'll be, it'll be interesting to get the golfer's feedback on it. How many volts does it put into the golfer when they swing wrong? It depends what they want. You know, what's interesting, every golfer ass does the same thing. If I do it wrong, it'll shock me. It's like, right. oh, oh, hold on. What happens, you know, if all of a sudden we go to cardiac arrest? We don't want that. Everybody's, a, everybody's funny joke, but there must be something in the uh, collective the collective zeitgeist or whatever. <laughs> there. People want that, huh? <laughs> you, know. Uh, you know, I guess we were all raised, you know, uh, don't do this or you get a spanking or something like that. So I don't know. I guess there's something there. Or maybe we do want to get spanked. I don't know. I don't know. I'd, a lot of times I'd rather I'd, I'd rather get shocked than look up and see how the golf ball is flying. I mean, that's just disgusting. So, uh, <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks, thanks for watching, everybody. Really appreciate you guys as we're approaching 50,000 subscribers, which will happen next wow. month. Wow. So uh, that'll be a big – we might do a big party or something like that for that. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you guys. Bye.